Okay. Okay, here we go again. Okay, so Dr. David Wiss um, is a registered dietitian since 2013, and he founded Nutrition and Recovery, a group practice of RDNs specializing in the treatment of eating and substance use disorders. He earned his Doctor of Philosophy degree in UCLA's Fielding School of Public Health in the Community Health Sciences Department with a minor in health psychology. Dr. Wiss can be um, your nutrition and health consultant. He's also a functional medicine pr practitioner, and he's a recovery coach. You can learn more about the intersection of nutrition and mental health at his new website, Wise Mind Nutrition, or you could follow him on social media at Dr. David Wiss. And with that, we cannot wait to hear your presentation, Dr. Wiss. Thank you so much for coming today. Wow. Thank you so much, Penelope. I guess we're starting a few minutes early. Uh, I'm excited to be here. I love uh, nutrition uh, as an RDN, and I'm very passionate about mental health. I know this is a new and growing area, so I'm honored to be sharing some of the cutting edge research as well as some of my experience um, clinically. So as mentioned, I'm the founder and owner of Nutrition and Recovery. Uh, we're a private practice in West LA. I don't have financial conflicts of interest. However, I'm pretty biased toward this conversation. I think nutrition for mental health is the future. I am invested in changing the paradigm, um, you know, really pushing this conversation forward uh, because I think it's important. And I'm talking about it a lot at Wise Mind Nutrition. So my practice, there's five of us and we work in mental health settings. Um, since 2013, we've serviced over 50 treatment facilities in Southern California, mostly substance use disorder, some eating disorder, some mental health. And as we know, some of these lines can be pretty blurry. So we do group facilitation and one-on-one -on -one care, mostly for disordered eating. I've done con some consulting work all over. And working in this setting has afforded me some unique insight into eating behaviors associated with addictions. Now, I just want to sort of introduce this conversation with a thought you know, I'm, I hope there's some eating disorder dietitians out there and uh, people that work in that space. And, you know, it's, it's a little tricky because, you know, a lot of eating disorders are associated with uh, rules, restriction, deprivation, internalized weight stigma. And as you probably know, a lot of the treatment is focused on including foods that someone may have been uh, fearful of being more moderate, et cetera. But if you look at the mental health research, you'll see that nutrition interventions, you know, for depression, for anxiety, uh, they're, they're pointing to people eating less ultra processed foods. So, you know, this is a, a, a tricky space, right? And so, you know, the question is, is like, what if someone has an eating disorder, but they also have major depression? and they're not responding well to first line medications, right? So one of the points of the presentation today is to really discuss this area of intersection. I will be talking about um, some of these other co-occurring disorders briefly. So I've always sort of posed this question, should nutrition researchers disclose their dietary preferences in their articles? In other words, if someone has a history of an eating disorder, is that going to affect their nutrition perspectives or food philosophy? If someone is a vegan, um, is that going to affect their research lens? If someone is on some other sort of uh, a plan? So I, I don't have any um, dietary preferences that I feel like uh, need to be disclosed. And I consider myself somewhat of a uh, dietary agnostic. I want to give a shout out to Australia. I do want to um, just really emphasize that this area of nutrition for mental health is uh, pretty well, um, you know, established or at least moving in that direction in Australia. In the UK, there's been some scholarly interest in Canada and in South America. And there's very little here in the US. And I hopefully you're scratching your head and wondering, you know, why might that be? So a couple key points. I'd like to add that nutrition research is somewhat difficult to conduct. Um, 
I've, I've done a bit. My PhD is actually in public health. So I didn't do nutrition research. I went to UCLA in the School of Public Health, Community Health Sciences Department, and I did a lot of mental health research. So a lot of my academic work has been focused on early life trauma, depression, anxiety. Um, I've done a lot of work with food addiction and binge eating. And hopefully everyone's already aware that nutrition is just... Um, rife with uh, contention and disagreement, right? Uh, a lot of the uh, impacts of nutrition can be slow, not to say that people can't have rapid transformations in just a week of uh, changing their eating patterns or their cognitive processes. But I like to look at nutrition as sort of a life course epidemiology um, you know, question, right? Like how does food affect us over the lifespan? How does what we eat during pregnancy affect the offspring? So we know that in nutritional epidemiology, there's lots of mixed findings, you know, coffee, this coffee, that egg yolks, that, I mean, we all know this, right? And that there's a wide range of different approaches that can work for people. And since everyone eats, most people tend to have an opinion. And I've seen the formation of groups based on a nutritional identity, whether this be people in the online space or professionals, right? Um, banding together to form a tribe of like-minded individuals, which is incredible and important for our survival as a species. But it is safe to say that in the nutrition space, some of this energy can get quite toxic when there are diet wars and a lot of um, just unnecessary. Uh, uh. So when we talk about nutrition for mental health, I mean, there's really three sort of major areas, you know, there's gut health, which we know uh, links to the brain bi-directionally. Um, this is the burgeoning field of nutritional psychology, thinking about inflammatory processes that start in the gut and that can travel to the brain. Uh, and then there's nutrients for, for the brain, right? Whether that be vitamins, minerals, um, phytochemicals, et cetera. And then the th Third area, which is something I'm very interested in, is the idea of nutritional psychology, how one thinks about food, the messaging, the language, the experience of living in a body, uh, perhaps a body that doesn't feel like home. So we, we talk about weight stigma. And I'm really interested in nutrition for mental health because it challenges this sort of calorie model that's been around forever, right? I think once upon a time, the calorie model and the macronutrient model seem to dominate the space. And there were certain assumptions made like, you know, less calories is better, right? And then we have the era of artificial sweeteners and diet foods and diet culture. And nutrition for mental health really is a new lens that somewhat challenges this model, not to say that it, it isn't um, uh, based in, in a lot of science, but just that we have new ways of thinking about things, right? So in uh, psychiatry and in public health epidemiology, we often use you know, a biopsychosocial model, thinking about biology, psychology, and social context, and how a lot of this can drive inflammatory processes and impact the brain and the mind. And just to add something there, the, the brain and the mind are not necessarily the same thing. The brain might be uh, the actual organ, whereas the mind is all of the uh, constructs that can live within that space. So historically, nutrition for mental health has looked at, you know, vitamin and mineral deficiencies. There was, you know, early studies that linked cross-sectionally, you know, deficiencies with certain nutrients, with certain psychological conditions. Of course, there's been a lot of interest in essential fatty acids, omega-3 particularly, and then amino acids as being uh, precursors for neurotransmitters. And, and some of that has really, um, you know, made some progress since we've understood the role of the gut microbiota in, um, you know, the conversion of some of those amino acids to neurotransmitters. And then of course, the conversation of do neurotransmitters in the gut equal neurotransmitters in the brain? So there's a lot of need for uh, more investigation there. Trends that we've seen, you know, food and mood. Uh, maybe you've ran a group called Food and Mood. Um, you know, these are things that we've intuitively known for a long time, and now we have a little bit more data. 
to understand how food affects mood. And then of course, emotional eating and, and, and that term, you know, could also cross over with stress eating. Of course, that could mean overeating. It could also mean under eating. And now we have terms like addiction, like eating or food addiction, which I'll touch on today. And then here now we have more about the immune system, right? Food allergies, sensitivities, gut health, microbiome, inflammation, and oxidative stress. So once again, this is work from Australia. Nutrition and Dietetics is the Journal of Dietitians in Australia. They recently have had a couple uh, big issues on this topic. And this was a rapid review of reviews that looked at dietary interventions in mental health treatment. And just to give you an idea of what's out there, you know, a lot of the interventions for substance use disorders, which has really been, you know, an area that I've worked on, depression and anxiety are predominantly supplementation based because you probably realize that doing, you know, controlled trials with actual food is, is difficult. You know, you can't blind people, uh, adherence is low. So a lot of the uh, research in this area, some of the stuff coming out of Europe has really just been about using supplements to see how they might improve mental health. And I am certainly interested in supplements, uh, but as a dietitian, I've become very, very interested in eating behavior, you know, uh, quote unquote relationship with food. So I think that just looking at single nutrients can be somewhat reductionistic. They can, of course, lead to supplement protocols, which are very, very helpful. But, you know, we also have to think about what we eat. And as I mentioned, our relationship with food, and this goes beyond nutrition. This, this starts to look at how we interact with the world. You know, we see, you know, binge and restrict cycles playing out with people emotionally. Um, some people, you know, restrict emotions and then sort of go on binges. So we have to think beyond nutrition and put it into the context of one's uh, lived experience, uh, the rate at which we consume food, right? How we think about food and how this all sort of interacts. So in, in you know, the work that I do with Wise Mind Nutrition, we're really thinking about when to eat, what to eat, how to eat, right? Which is the mindful and soulful eating components, uh, how much to eat um, and uh, how to think about food right? And I make the argument that if you focus on when to eat, what to eat, and how to eat, the how much to eat should uh, uh, make itself clear. So as I mentioned, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the big picture, right? We, we call the life course perspective, a broader way of understanding human health and development, thinking about multiple pathways that can uh, affect health, both positively and negatively. We think about periods of time that can be you know, critical for developmental processes and how risk factors and protective factors accumulate over time, right? Also thinking about transgenerational inheritance. So these are big, big ideas that are oftentimes very difficult to research with single studies. So we have to pull together bodies of literature. And as I mentioned, a lot of my work has been on early life adversity. This includes various stressors, traumas, and forms of deprivation that are experienced during the first 18 years of life. Uh, it could be in utero. Um, it could be ACEs, which, you know, I've done some, my, my PhD dissertation was on ACEs, uh, which are adverse childhood experiences, uh, forms of child maltreatment, um, um, uh, household dysfunction, and uh, that could be parents divorced, uh, going to prison, mental illness, and then of course, multiple forms of neglect. There's other ACEs that can occur in the community, in the schools, bullying, discrimination, other forms of denigration. And then there's uh, other forms of adversity like poor nutrition, toxin exposure, lack of cognitively uh, stimulating experiences. And we know that Early life adversity is strongly correlated with social and environmental factors, but it does occur across all levels of socioeconomic status. And with respect to mental health, it has been suggested that in some cases, time does not heal all wounds. I did a systematic review and meta-analysis a few years ago linking ACEs to BMI. We just pooled the data from the cross-sectional studies and found that a um, exposure to multiple ACEs uh, was associated with a 46% increase 
in the odds of adult obesity, if that's an acceptable term. And we looked at what are some of the biologically plausible explanations? Why is it that people exposed to early life trauma have different eating behaviors and uh, has different effects on BMI across the lifespan? As I mentioned, I've been very interested in addiction like eating, which has a lot of relevance for some forms of eating disorders, of course, substance use disorders, and depression, anxiety. And we're going to be talking a bit about depression today. I've done some work on this concept of biological embedding, and this is very relevant to our topic today, which is depression, um, because a lot of the effects of trauma um, can be um, embedded into one's physiology. We say it gets underneath the skin, and a lot of those um, pathways are also related to uh, certain depressive phenotypes. Not all forms of depression are the same, and we're going to go there in a minute. So the question is, how does stress, trauma, and adversity get under the skin, change eating behavior, increase BMI? How might increased BMI lead to the internalization of weight stigma, which can also be a form of stress? It can drive dieting behavior, what we call dietary restraint in, in, in the scientific literature. And how does dietary restraint lead to um, disordered eating, including loss of control eating, things that we associate with food addiction. And then of course, when we think about things like stress, trauma, and adversity, we have to go even further upstream and think about the social factors like SES, the food environment, et cetera. So I've spent a lot of years reading literature and making diagrams like these where um, we're just trying to figure out what are the pathways um, and how does this play out over time? So some of the debates that have emerged from the food addiction um, field are, you know, is this concept valuable in the treatment of eating disorders? How do we know if the food addiction is an actual addiction or just a symptom of someone's excessive dieting behavior, their pathological restraint, we call it? And should food addiction be better called an eating addiction and viewed behaviorally rather than as a substance addiction? And if someone does meet criteria for food addiction and doesn't have a history of pathological dieting, how should we treat this person nutritionally? And I'm not going to answer any of these. We're going to be moving in another direction. But I do think it is relevant because the data that we have that I'm going to cover shows that ultra-processed food, um, which are typically the foods that someone might consume in an addiction-like pattern, are pretty strongly correlated with depression. So coming back to early life adversity, just to give you a little bit more context on the biology, two people could be exposed to the same type of adversity. And depending on someone's uh, genotype, they might be more vulnerable to this concept of biological embedding. We know that adversity can affect the way that the brain processes reward. And this is, you know, generally the dopamine system. We know that adversity can affect threat processing. And this is in the amygdala. Um, certain people can become hyper vigilant to threats and kind of go through life in more of a fight or flight state. And then, of course, processing of memories. And this is mostly in the hippocampus. So, yeah, some people can emerge from adversity and be very resilient and have a lower risk of a psychiatric disorder, and others will have a heightened risk. I've also done some work on childhood sexual abuse, which is strongly associated with depression. Um, in my dissertation, uh, uh, we actually looked at childhood sexual abuse among men and depression as being one of my outcomes of interest. And so I, I, if I haven't made it clear, you know, my work at the intersection of nutrition and mental health has really been on you know, eating disorders, substance use disorders, and food addiction, and how these cluster and co-occur with anxiety uh, and depression. And then, of course, some of the measurable outcomes that we look at um, have been BMI, um, efforts to suppress uh, weight, which is where some of the eating disorder behavior comes into the picture. If you're interested in learning more about the biological embedding, this paper is fantastic, uh, Limitations of the Protective Measure Theory in Explaining the Role of Childhood Sexual Abuse in Eating Disorders, Addictions, and Obesity. I believe it's it may, it may be open access. Um, it looks at some of these pathways and mechanisms. There's another review, which I know is open access, that looks at how childhood adversity is biologically embedded. 
thinking about pathways such as epigenetic changes, specifically DNA methylation, particularly, you know, as it relates to the HPA axis, um, changes in the brain, um, you know, functional connectivity, um, cortisol, we have the immune system, and then there's some other pathways like gut dysbiosis, um, there's telomeres, the vagus nerve, there's more. Okay, so uh, these are relevant biological embedding pathways linked to early life trauma. And as I move the conversation toward depression, you're also going to notice that these are some of the same uh, uh, changes, biological changes that can be targeted by nutrition interventions. So we know that the immune system regulates the inflammatory cascade. We know that early life activation can sensitize traumatized individuals to the effects of subsequent stressors. So those that had early life adversity are more likely to be prone to later life trauma. We know that early life adversity increases the production of monocytes and macrophages that have strong pro-inflammatory tendencies. Some of these, um, uh, it starts in the bone marrow and then can lead to low-grade systemic inflammation that can accumulate over time. The question is, how can some of this uh, affect the brain, right? And this is the whole kind of hot area of the blood-brain barrier, leaky brain, et cetera. So yes, we have uh, a host of inflammatory cytokines that have been investigated, linked to trauma, as well as linked to depression. So this is just a little conceptual model. If you think about early life stress, increasing um, immune uh, system uh, for better or for worse, and um, certainly creating persistent low-grade peripheral inflammation and the potential for that to cross the blood-brain barrier, perhaps lead to neuroinflammation, um, in some cases in the amygdala, all of which can increase risky behaviors, including alcohol, drugs, and highly palatable food. So this is this concept of leaky brain. Everyone's heard the term leaky gut. This is somewhat of a new idea. Um, can pro-inflammatory cytokines act at the level of the microglia and the astrocytes and increase blood-brain barrier permeability? And the science is starting to say yes. And this is when we bring it back to the food conversation, the disordered eating stuff, right? It turns out that of all the risk factors for altered intestinal integrity, this is the um, leaky gut, it is the Western style diet, right? It is um, ultra processed food that has you know, the biggest impact on uh, the immune system, right? So question is like, what do we do? Is this a public health issue? How do we treat individuals? Um, what's next? And, you know, this just outlines the kind of um, interaction between gut microbiota and the immune system. Uh, on the left, you have symbiosis, which is the ideal state where the mucosal barrier is intact. As we get more permeability, we're, we're getting more inflammation, more oxidative stress affecting microbial diversity. And then I would make the argument that a lot of people are living in this red zone, the altered symbiosis, a lot of permeability, uh, much less bacterial diversity, much more oxidative stress and sustained low level inflammation. So the future is now the gut, the brain, right? A lot of these pathways are starting to be elucidated, um, linking um, the gut and the brain through the immune system, nervous system, vascular system. And as dietitians, I think it's safe to say if we are um, having an impact on what people put into their gut, then we can have an impact on brain function. The future is now. We know that poor diets can lead to chronic oxidative stress, alter redox signaling and neurotransmitter content, can increase impulsivity and addiction-like behaviors, lead to more food craving, and the cycle continues. So when we think about the pathways between the gut and the brain, it's safe to say that all of them are nutrition-related, right? Nutrition links to intestinal permeability, the immune system, um, uh, the bacterial uh, environment, 
and the HPA access. This might be difficult to see, and I'm going to go through it quickly, but I just want to share about some of the mechanistic work um, that has been done. Uh, I took a really deep dive into the literature with early life adversity and alcohol and how both of them can increase risk for uh, anxiety and depression and how some of these risk factors accumulate and some of the mediating pathways. So yes, um, uh, we know that chronic alcohol can lead to dysbiosis, intestinal permeability, all of which is going to activate the immune system starting in the gut. We know that that can travel to the liver, cause uh, inflammation, um, uh, in the liver, which can travel throughout the body. We know that that can cross the blood-brain barrier, um, the tight junctions in the neurovascular endothelial cells. We talked about leaky brain, neuroinflammation, uh, potentially at the level of the amygdala, all of which lead to anxiety, depression, and craving, and can increase risk for relapse, right? So, you know, the question is, is like, you know, where do we step in? Like what's, you know, um, uh, adequate intervention points. And I think it would be silly not to say that food is one of them. Yeah, food can be helpful in uh, trauma, depression, alcohol recovery. And it is a difficult thing to implement because, you know, insurance doesn't cover it. If you do it at a facility, it's probably a private facility. Um, some of them don't want to pay for these kind of services, but when we can make the argument uh, that dietary interventions are important, I think that um, a lot more and more people are getting on board. So when we think about depression, this is a mood disorder. There are different sort of uh, terms and types. You know, we have major depressive disorder, which is also you know been referred to as clinical depression, and then we have depressive symptoms. So when you measure something by a research tool like the CESD or the PHQ-9, um, it's not a diagnosis of depression. Someone is showing signs of depressive symptoms. And then um, uh, you can see depression broken into unipolar versus bipolar, unipolar being the same as major depressive disorder and bipolar depression, formerly known as manic depression, is associated with mood swings uh, all the way to the manic states. So again, this is Canada, did some uh, uh, important work looking at guidelines for the treatment of psychiatric disorders with nutraceuticals and phytoceuticals. You know, there are websites out there, hopefully, you know, you're aware of Consumer Lab, which I take a look at. They have information about uh, supplements for depression. Examine.com is another website that I've uh, spent some time with. But just pulling from this uh, article in the World Journal of Biological Psychiatry, this is uh, you know some of the evidence for supplements related to depression. Um, Omega three, you know, has been recommended for adjunctive use, whereas like for um, bipolar, maybe. Uh, less so. It says weekly recommended. Vitamin D has got some good evidence, uh, particularly when used in conjunction with other treatments. Saffron actually has a lot of good data. There's um, some actual trials that have shown saffron to be helpful for depressive symptoms. Probiotics, you know, about half the studies show yes, half say show no. Zinc provisionally recommended. Folate-based compounds, um, curcumin, and then St. John's wort has always shown some uh, use in mild major depressive disorder. I've used a lot of these supplements and recommended them for people in recovery. So when we don't have evidence-based treatment, sometimes we have to look at the treatment-based evidence. Uh, most people do report that eating less processed foods and more whole foods does improve wellness and mood. Uh, this impact is more pronounced in some people than others. We never really knew why, you know, we knew food affects mood, but we do now, right? A lot of highly processed foods do have ingredients that negatively impact gut microbiota, and this in turn affects mental health. So, um, you know, when we think about ultra processed foods, it's not just about ingredients that have been added, whether that be, you know, salt, sugar, fat, or, you know, uh, 
flavors, colors, emulsifiers, binders, et cetera. But it's also what's being removed. When I think about ultra processed food, the thing that um, really gets my attention is the fiber content and how the fiber has generally been stripped from these foods. And we know that fiber is strongly linked to gut health, which in turn affects mental health. So when we think about depression and diet, this is uh, clinically relevant to food addiction, substance use disorders, and eating disorders. A lot of overlap. The link between depression and diet is bidirectional, which means that highly palatable foods can serve to alleviate the depressive symptoms. And then we also know that low quality diet can increase depressive symptoms. And this has been shown in longitudinal studies. Uh, these are you know, cohorts that um, are followed for many years. And we do see very clearly that ultra processed food as it increases, increases the risk for depressive symptoms. And we know that the Mediterranean diet is the most evidence-based approach to reducing depressive symptoms, at least um, to date. Um, and there's been seven randomized controlled trials. So once again, if we were to look at where this is coming from, this is Australia. Once again, um, they did a systematic review looking at the dietary interventions to uh, decrease depression levels. These are studies that were not focused on weight. We know that um, weight and depression can be correlated. So these were actual studies focused on increasing the intake of fresh produce, whole grains, et cetera, as well as decreasing the intake of ultra processed foods. And seven out of seven showed promise for reducing depression. Um, I will say that the evidence for depression is stronger than it is for anxiety. This was another meta-analysis. So dietary interventions after pooling some of the studies did have a notable effect on depressive symptoms, but didn't quite make the cut for anxiety. So when we think about the symptoms of depression, we have depressed mood, anhedonia, which can be the inability to feel pleasure, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, suicidal ideation, which could be a plan or an attempt, uh, fatigue or loss of energy, sleep decrease or increase. That's Im important. You know, a lot of people with depressive symptoms will sleep uh, too much. And this can be um, uh, tricky when it comes to uh, research. You think about like a U-shaped curve. Uh, weight or appetite could either decrease or increase. Uh, decreased ability to think or concentrate, or someone might be very indecisive. We also see psychomotor agitation. So when we think about the biology of depression, and this has been a hot topic, primarily because, you know, in the last few years, it's been shown that the first-line medications, which are SSRIs, don't work for a lot of people. And, you know, that's really where some of these new questions came. If, if SSRIs aren't working, then this monoamine hypothesis, which is really you know focused on the serotonin system, um, you know, doesn't apply to all people with depression. What are some of the other pathways, right? And are you know other phenotypes, right? So there's a known inflammatory phenotype of depression. And once we can parse out differences in individuals with depression, how can that point to different interventions? We know that the HPA access can be involved in depression's biology. Um, as you probably know, this is responsible for the human stress response via cortisol. We have neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. Uh, this is you know, uh, the ability to create new neural pathways uh, with brain-derived neurotrophic factor can facilitate resilience against stress, inflammation, which we talked about, a uh, huge topic, structural and functional brain changes, which could be measured through neuroimaging techniques like PET scans and functional MRI. And then with genes, you know, it's rarely, rarely a single gene. So you have to look at multiple genes, which we call polygenic. And then, of course, epigenetics. This is the modification of genes that don't alter the genetic code itself, really just the gene expression. So when we think about mechanisms linking depression and diet, we, of course, have the gut microbiota. And this is the collection of microbes that colonize the GI tract. We have oxidative stress, which is related to inflammation. 
Uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, big topic. You know, we're looking at the mitochondria inside of the cell, which is responsible for energy production um, as linking to uh, certain phenotypes of depression. And then the tryptophan kynurenine metabolism, which really links back to the monoamine hypothesis. If this pathway is disrupted, it's going to have an impact on serotonin. And then, uh, of course, we mentioned brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is related to synaptic plasticity. So there's been a couple of big articles recently which have attempted to map out some of these pathways that link diet with depression. If you think about you know, what an ideal sort of uh, way of eating could be for someone with mental health um, would be a, a pattern that was high in phytochemicals, vitamins and minerals, uh, poly and monounsaturated fats and fiber. And you could see that, you know, all of these have known impacts on HPA access, oxidative stress, inflammation, gut microbiota, and epigenetic state. Of course, there's links between some of these. For example, gut microbiota um, can produce short chain fatty acids, which can in turn uh, have an effect on inflammation. And then we take it to the next stage and look at neurogenesis. Um, which is you know, coming in from gut microbiota, oxidative stress, as well as directly through the diet. And um, neurogenesis can help maintain hippocampal density. And that is uh, in some cases gonna be related to depressive symptoms. Um, there's also a pathway there through the mitochondrial function. And then at the bottom end of this uh, uh, diagram, we have the sort of tryptophan related uh, pathways, which really look at neurotransmitters, like I mentioned, uh, serotonin, et cetera. So I wouldn't say that all of this is very clearly mapped out yet. This is, you know, if you look at the, the, the name of the figure, it's a proposed interplay. So, you know, these are potential pathways, some of which have been, you know, clearly elucidated and some which are still in the kind of theoretical and experimental phase, but we're starting to see the picture. We're starting to see the picture. Um, you know, the tricky part, as you probably know, is like, okay, once we know this, you know, the hard part is like, how how do we get people uh, to change their eating behavior, right? That's that's the work. And this is another uh, diagram, similarly, that looks at the interaction between the characteristics of the, Mon the Mediterranean diet and unipolar depression. Um, again, very similar story being told here. If you think about why does the Mediterranean diet work so well, we've got you know the antioxidants, fibers, and vitamins that are in fruits and vegetables. Um, we've got the monounsaturated fatty acids and the polyphenols from olive oil. We've got the monounsaturated acids and the fiber that are in nuts, and of course the omega three from fish. And then yeah, movement and connection, right? Uh, purpose, et cetera. That's all part of the quote unquote Mediterranean lifestyle. And so, yeah, we're seeing a lot of these pathways that we've already covered today from, you know, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines crossing the blood brain barrier, um, HPA access related to cortisol, also known to disrupt gut function, how some of this can uh, affect hormones and circadian rhythms. Um, and then, of course, you know, when we look at uh, monoamine activity, uh, neurotransmitter function, we have to think about vitamins. And that's why a lot of vitamin studies were done early on. You know, some of these are important for uh, production, et cetera, uh, methylation processes. And uh, lastly, we've got, you know, neurotrophism and neuronal activity. So lots of, lots of support for the concept that nutrition can be helpful for depressive symptoms. In my clinical experience, um, you know, I would argue that the, the most important thing is fiber because most people aren't getting enough. Uh, and I'm talking about fiber that comes from foods 
rather than from supplements. If people have been on the quote unquote Western diet for a long time, it's going to be difficult to move them up towards 30 plus grams of fiber from fruits, vegetables, whole, whole grains, beans, et cetera. So sometimes this is the real work is making someone's gut fiber friendly, increasing their fiber very slowly. Sometimes I say one baby carrot at a time. Um, and yeah, focusing on just improving gut health, you know, oftentimes in functional medicine, we say, you know, just start with the gut and, you know, these things can be tricky and sometimes do require some trial and error as well as potentially some supplements. Big fan of getting fiber from food. Of course, there are some good prebiotic supplements on the market, but really liking to change people's eating behavior so that they have a preference for new foods that will allow them to continue to eat those things after they're done uh, with treatment and trying to get people on the variety train, eating a wide range of plant foods on a daily basis, getting a fruit or vegetable with every meal and snack. Uh, you probably are uh, aware of all the prebiotic foods or some of the foods that are high in prebiotic fibers. You know, it's funny, you know, some of these things like, you know, if you look at the data and it's like, okay, what are the you know, the best prebiotic foods? And it's like Jerusalem artichokes and chicory. And then people go to the, the store and they don't have those foods, <laughs> you know? So it's like, we need to think about, and like garlic and onion, sometimes people don't eat them in the quantity enough to get uh, prebiotics. So uh, I'm really big into beans and whole grains. Um, I think that's a way to really get a lot more bang for buck. And of course, you know, being practical, like not everyone's going to eat green bananas. You know what I mean? Um, so those are things to always think about when making recommendations. Uh, the data of recent years has shown that, you know, it's not just the fiber or the prebiotics, but that they work in concert with the polyphenols that are in uh, plant foods. Um, you're probably aware that a, a phenol is a stable six carbon benzene ring that can donate an electron because of its structure, it, it's stable enough to donate uh, without causing uh, too much disruption. The benzene ring is extremely strong. Therefore, it can scavenge free radicals. It can pick up things. Um, and this is why we call them antioxidants. Um, polyphenols is a lot of these things bound together. You can see the diagram on the right. These are very complex, diverse chemical structures. And yeah, dietary polyphenols have a, a lot of scientific support for reducing oxidative stress, neuroinflammation, um, improving brain function, and that there's a synergy between the fiber and the polyphenols that occur at the level of the gut, which reinforce the importance of eating real food. Polyphenols can be broken down into flavonoids or non-flavonoids, and uh, there's just a lot of compounds here. You've probably heard of some of these from green tea or in apple skins or you know the resveratrol most people know from red wine, grapes, et cetera. And then of course, we've got the fermented foods. Um, you know, and and this is just more pathways proposed pathways that link, you know, the probiotics and prebiotics, um, you know, with intestinal barrier function, inflammation, HPA access, neurotransmitters, vitamins, gut health, all of which are linked to depressive and anxiety symptoms. Best anti-inflammatory foods, some of them are outlined here. You'll see, you know, cruciferous vegetables, colorful fruits, um, certain types of whole grains, proteins that have omega-3s. I'm really big into beans, nuts, and seeds. I get a lot of people. Uh, it's actually a food group in my system. Beans, nuts, and seeds, it's its own food group. Um, and then of course, some of the better fats and then also herbs and spices. Uh, I think that um, these don't get enough spotlight uh, when you think about, you know, the, the rosemaries and the you know, the parsleys and the cilantro, these all have a lot of polyphenols. There's been uh, some good research looking at probiotics for depression. Uh, oftentimes, because depression and anxiety co-occur, sometimes they get lumped together. Uh, but I will say just from looking at the body of the research, 
uh, the evidence is stronger for depression than it is for anxiety. So again, pointing to the role of nutrition and supplements in uh, improving depressive outcomes. <clears throat> we know that um, psychotropic medications affect the gut. There's some really awesome work coming out of Ireland. Uh, you've probably seen the names Dinan and Cryon. Uh, they've done some incredible work showing how microbes metabolize drugs and vice versa. And this is the future of behavioral health. When we think about, you know, someone's gut health, we have to look at their uh, medication, supplements, drug and alcohol history, alcohol, nicotine, et cetera. And this can be a quite complicated symptom picture. So this is a recent paper towards nutritional policies for brain health a research perspective on future action. So this is just a broad overview of, of sort of, you know, public health initiatives, right? It says healthy food for all is a responsibility of policy and requires public funding. Uh, areas that we need to increase scientific evidence, identify nutrients that impact brain health, invest in clinical research, uh, identify neuronal circuit cells and molecules linking nutrition with brain health, bridging basic science mechanisms to clinical outcomes, and then, of course, producing effective messages, like how do we implement these things? How do we personalize nutrition? How do we improve <clears throat> nutrition education? <clears throat> and I'll say that's the work, um, team. That's the work. It's not knowing the pathways. Knowing the pathways isn't going to change people's lives. It really is effective communication. <clears throat> but I will say this, when I can describe the pathways to people, and describe the mechanisms, it makes more sense why they might be doing certain things. We see what we see on the surface. We see the leaves and we see the uh, the branches, but there's a lot more going on um, at the root, right? In functional medicine, we talk about the root cause, but in public health, we go beyond the root and we wanna look at the soil, the entire social and environmental context. And this is what we call the social determinants of health. I'm seeing the chat going off and just taking a look at that. I'm happy to come back to some slides during questions. All truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as being self-evident. And food for thought is no substitute for the real thing. Okay, I, I saw some things come in through the chat. Um, and I can certainly circle back to some slides. Um, feel free to continue the conversation on social media. Please check out Wise Mind Nutrition. That's where I'm talking all things food for mood and brain health. Um, and it looks like we have some time. Someone's asking to go back to the fiber rich foods. I can do that. Prebiotic foods, yes, uh, this list. Um, someone's asking about folks with anxiety and depression and GI problem, very, very common, you know, um, like IBS or migraines triggered by foods have um, a tough time with the healthy diet approach and getting more variety in helpful foods. Yeah. I mean, part of nutrition for mental health is being realistic and meeting people where they're at, right? Like I don't do aggressive dietary interventions with people. Um, I'm more interested in doing long-term work with someone, building rapport, getting people to make baby steps and make some of the changes on their own. You know, I don't prescribe diets to people. I don't, you know give people a list of foods to eat or not eat. I might make some very broad recommendations. Um, but yeah, I think that most people have tough time with dietary change. And I've been doing one-on-one -on -one counseling for 10 years and you sort of learn like you, 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 you recommend things that they want to do. You find out what they're able to do and sort of move in that direction. Uh, variety is tricky. There are little things that I try to do with variety, maybe encourage people to grocery shop more often. Um, 
try not to repeat food in the course of a day. Look for foods they haven't tried within the last month. Every week, try to eat, you know, one food that they haven't had recently. Those are the kind of interventions that I'm more likely to do with someone rather than try to, you know, put them on some drastic change. Like, let's just focus on more variety, you know, for this week and not repeat foods, et cetera. So hopefully uh, that's helpful. The, the GI stuff is tricky, of course. Um, and I think all of us are trying to figure that out. Wendy has an excellent question. Any advice for towing the line between the evidence that ultra processed food is correlated with depression with the concern that restriction and dieting is correlated with binge eating, food addiction, and disordered eating in general. Yeah, these are the conversations that I'm most um, interested. I think that, you know, everyone is different. And so being able to really connect with someone and get good insight into their psychiatric profile. And what I mean by that is like, you know, someone's proclivity for, you know, restriction, if they've had a history of an eating disorder, body dissatisfaction and bringing all that into the symptom picture. I might not make the argument that their you know, depression is correlated with ultra processed food. Um, some of that language might be a little triggering to some people. It's the kind of thing that you'd see on social media, right? That can lend itself to, okay, pass fail nutrition, you know, don't do this, do this instead. Um, but you can move someone in the direction of eating more uh, anti-depressive foods by focusing on foods to eat rather than foods not to eat. So, I mean, you know, some of those randomized controlled trials that looked at improvements in depressive symptoms, they, of course, um, um, you know, were promoting foods that were high in uh, polyphenols and fiber, and then, you know, also discouraging ultra processed foods. I think that if someone has a history of uh, disordered eating, or there's concern about pass fail, black and white thinking, that just focusing on what to do rather than what not to do is a very safe approach. And um, yeah, I, I use that often. And, you know, like I said before, also not feeling like it's your job to, you know, be their expert and just sort of be their coach. You know, I, I do like that model as well. Um, Deborah's asking for the fiber slide. Um, maybe this was the fiber slide. Hopefully not too much helpful information there. Um, Penelope, thank you. Yeah, I have an app. That's called Wise Mind Nutrition, and um, it's actually launching in January. And um, you know, if you were to go to Wise Mind Nutrition, you, you could opt in, and there's a, a freebie, which is five ways you can use nutrition to improve your mental health. And the app is basically, um, you know, a food log that is non-math centric. And what I mean by that is, you know, we're we're making the nutrition approach eating disorder friendly, trauma informed. It's a place for people to um, log their qualitative progress with food. So looking at what food groups were present, hunger hunger score before, fullness score after. Thinking about um, some of the more qualitative components with food, and then. Uh, reviewing their, their journey, like the way someone in recovery would do, like every night looking at what are some victories? What are some things I did well? Uh, you know, did I meet my intentions for water today and bowel movement? So it's a lifestyle medicine approach. Uh, it's a wise mind. That's good, Kelly. Thank you for that. Um, wisemind.com, wisemindnutrition.com. Um, yeah, the app also has uh, educational videos. And so the, the free version, there's a free version of the app and all dietitians can use it with their clients as a coach and just view their food log and see their nightly review. And then there's education in there, which, you know, is basically gentle nutrition. So it's really at the intersection of encouraging nutrition for mental health without any like rigid rules. Okay. So it's like basically the stuff that I've been working on is 
intersection nutrition. Um, we don't really talk about food addiction. We don't talk about eating disorders. Uh, it really is more about, you know, food for mood and brain health, gut health, et cetera, designed to help people that have depression and anxiety. So I cover the five components of Wise Mind Nutrition, which is, you know, when to eat, what to eat, how to eat, how to, how to, how much to eat and how to think about food. And then there's a paid program, which is a 30 day program where we assess people's um, uh, mental health at the beginning. So we're looking at several different screening tools, uh, depression, anxiety, trauma, eating disorder, addiction, et cetera. Some of the uh, uh, results from their intake process do lead to some personalized messaging. So if people have uh, meet criteria based on the screening tools for certain mental health conditions. They, they'll get some different language, uh, perhaps some different recommendations. But the 30-day program is uh, filled with assignments, handouts. It's basically designed to mimic the experience of working with me over you know, a period of six months. You know, Tons of uh, nutrition for mental health, recipes, et cetera. And I made it very cheap. It's very affordable. I come from public health. I want people to be able to access this. So there's a free version of the app, the paid program. Uh, the 30-day program is, is only $295. And you'll get like every handout that I've like that you could dream of. And you know, there's a dashboard where people are doing assignments and setting intentions. And it's very, very wise in the fact that it doesn't have potential to be triggering like a lot of apps on the marketplace do. And if you're a practitioner um, and you went through the program, you could be in a position where you could kind of supervise other people through. So maybe you've been doing nutrition counseling for a long time and you know some of the stuff gets repetitive. This is a chance for you to let, to outsource all the like nutrition education you know, to video programming so that you can just focus on the counseling so that you can encourage people, build rapport, check in what's going right, where are some difficulties, see where people want to work on some things. And it's going to make the job of the dietitian working in the nutrition for mental health setting much easier because we don't know how much time we have with people. Sometimes you only get to meet with someone a few times. And so you don't have a chance to provide all the education. So I am working to provide the education in vi videos and through assignments so that dietitians can, um, you know, uh, focus on some of the other uh, contextual stuff and the, the lifestyle stuff. Hopefully I did that justice in my Wise Mind Nutrition Elevator pitch. You can look at the website and it's a pretty brand new landing page. You can learn more about it. And I'll be sending out emails very soon with links to download the app and lots of resources on the website as well.